Uh, when I grew up, Petra, a Christian rock group, they were my favorite band. And, you know, these guys were just, I thought, amazing musicians. And they came up with a song in 1989 called Homeless Few. And if I just recall off the top of my head, without singing, uh, uh, some of the lyrics were under the red, white, and blue, right down the street uh, in our view. We're not doing all we can do to shelter the homeless few. And it was really a great, I can't say great, it was really inspiring uh, song that they came out with. This was on their On Fire album in 1989. A few years later, uh, one of the uh, guitarists, uh, Pete Orta had left the band, and he and his wife decided to operate their own homeless shelter in uh, Texas, where, the, where they're from. And Pete and Kelly have done a fabulous job taking uh, homeless youth off the streets, giving them love, and at the same time giving them some uh, accountability and the guidance they need in their lives. And so they created In Triumph, which you can uh, visit them at intriumph.org. And they've done fabulous work down there. And, and they, they had a little bit of a difficulty earlier this year. And Pete, who I've gotten a chance to know over the last few years, he and I really had uh, solidified a friendship. And so it's, it's rare that you actually find that the people that you look up to in your youth, you, know, you become friends with them when, when you're uh, an adult. And I've had that opportunity with Pete. And again, there's not a whole lot I wouldn't do for him uh, and his uh, shelter in Triumph. But now the question is, what is being done here in the Twin Cities? Are we doing anything like this? Are we doing anything with the homeless? And there are a lot of homeless-oriented or, uh, or, organizations that are out there. And some of them are doing fabulous work. Some of them are just going to ask for more government handouts and not have the accountability in there. But I want to tell you or show you uh, one group that is really starting to do something just in their short time in existence. And that group is called Life Prep Academy. And I've got one of their uh, brochures right here. And our producer, uh, Dallas, and I, we kind of crashed their uh, holiday open house yesterday. And we had a chance to meet some of the people there. And, we, and we've, um, well, thanks to Dallas, he's put together this segment right here. Okay, so Pam, can you tell us about the history of Life Prep, Life Prep Academy? Uh, well, the history, uh, first of all, in concept, has been at, at least a decade in the making. Um, I've been a teacher for 28 years, and um, throughout the years, uh, at different times, uh, seeing a need for kids who are in high school who um, were high-risk kids, uh, I, I worked at Lino uh, at the juvenile center there and I would see kids who would intentionally sabotage themselves when they were coming off probation and just because they knew where they were was a good place for them, that they were safe, um, they had people who cared about them and, and it just didn't make sense that you know kids should have to commit a crime in order to be in a setting you know that's good for them. Um, that was one part of it. The other part is the huge homelessness problem that we have. Um, one area we're looking at that we're focusing on is Anoka County, but we're definitely not limited to Anoka County. But in Anoka County alone, statistically, about 500 youth per night are, are unattached, homeless. And so those two concepts kind of came together, and the timing was right, and, and felt that maybe this was a niche that we could find a way of addressing, um, making sure the kids' basic needs were being met, as well as then being able to um, give them a good education where they weren't having to worry about all those other things and so so how long did it take you to put to form the board of directors and get the early funding in order to come up with this concept in this location well the the getting the board of directors was a lot a lot easier than I thought it was going to be <laughs> basically it was uh, I had two people in mind um, Roger Chamberlain who was a senator and Ron Hansen who was a pastor and I went to each of them and told them what my thoughts were and
Quick look at a short clip uh, from Detroit 1967. This is the aftermath of the Detroit riot in 1967. This is when people just had enough. They burned down their own community. They called out the National Guard. Detroit has never fully recovered from the uh, riots of 1967. They haven't. How long is Ferguson, Missouri going to look like Detroit 1967? The scars in Detroit are still there. You know, we had a situation with Emmett Till in the 1950s. Now, I want to also, uh, before I get into Emmett Till, I wanted to show you my little guest today that I brought with me because I think it's time we take a look a little bit at reconciliation and healing. Right here, this is a bronze bust that was designed by Ed Dwight. Ed Dwight was the first black astronaut candidate, African-American, lives in uh, Denver. He uh, did not make it through the astronaut program, but he uh, made a, pro he was a prolific sculptor. In 2003, I was a photographer at the Tuskegee Airmen International Con uh, Convention in Denver and I won this bronze bust that Ed Dwight had designed. And I wanted to bring him in because one, he's my first guest, uh, but more importantly is the fact that when you look at what the Tuskegee Airmen did, these are the guys with the 332nd Fighter Group and the 440, 477th Bombardment Group in World War II. The, it, it was the first black pilots that we had in this country. And what did they do? They protected the, they were the fighter escorts for the bombers that were coming through, the long-range bombers, a lot of white crews. There were some white crews who said, oh, I don't, want, I, don't, I don't want to fly with these guys. Until they realized that these were the guys going in and doing the things that other white crews wouldn't do, bring them closer into the target. That their very safety hinged upon the Tuskegee Airmen. That's when they received acceptance. I had a chance to meet a lot of these uh, fine gentlemen. I was at the uh, at Coors Field with a um, with one of the uh, Tuskegee Airmen trainers, telling me all the stories about what they were doing at the Tuskegee Institute, pointing out the different people, and and saying, "Oh, this one used to do this. I remember running this guy's butt all around the track. Oh, this guy used to smart off to me, but you know, oh, we we corrected him in a hurry." But when he brought up to me. I wish I could remember his name, but what he brought up to me did leave a profound impact on my life. And the fact is, he said, we understood where the nation was, we understood where we were, and we were out to prove them wrong. We were out to prove them wrong. We knew we could do the job. We did not accept excuses. We did not be held down. We were not going to let ourselves be held down. We held our heads high and we wanted to go out and show that yes, a black man can pilot an aircraft. And we did a fine good job of it. The Tuskegee Airmen never lost one aircraft in the entire war that they were escorting. Let's take a closer look at the statue again. Never lost a crew. These guys came back from the war and they were doing the best that they could to build their communities. They weren't th firebombing. They weren't throwing the, uh, they, they weren't burning down pizza places. They weren't rioting in Detroit. They weren't destroying their community. They were trying to, too busy trying to build it up. They were trying to say, hey, we are black people and we did this. Let's be an example. And it's the Tuskegee Airmen that we should be looking up to as American citizens white, black, Asian, everybody. We should look up to what these guys were doing. Let's not take a look at what, let's not take a look at what we're seeing from Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton. These guys are the ones who are dividing We're going to start moving on to some more brighter topics because this is the holiday season, right? And we're all supposed to be of good cheer. 
And speaking of good cheer, I had uh, picked up today's issue of the St. Paul Pioneer Press, and it says, uh, now arriving, good cheer. So if our young intern, Andrew, can come on in a little bit closer, let's take a look. This is the uh, Canadian Pacific holiday train that came through town yesterday. As a matter of fact, it's kind of been in Minnesota all week. Um, the uh, Canadian Pacific had you know, put this up with um, a train all lit up, and they've been doing this for 16 years. And Tuesday, uh, our producer, Dallas, and I were down in uh, Hastings, and we caught the train there, and then again last night at the Union Depot. So right now what we're going to really show, because the Pioneer Press only just shows you the, uh, the front page. But what they don't do is they don't really tell you too much, and hey, I'm, I'm happy to see the CP Rail got the uh, front page. Um, but they haven't really shown you really much about the rest of the program. And I'm going to make a quick disclaimer here before we uh, roll the video. Yes, in the last few weeks you have heard me rail about uh, Warren Buffett's railroad, the BNSF Railroad, and talking about rail safety and the, and the Bakken uh, oil. And my point of these last few weeks of discussing this is not to go against the railroad, it's to go against the environmentalists who say that we can't put the Keystone XL pipeline in place because of all this environmental danger without taking into consideration of what's happening now. The railroads are the backbone of, of um, what we as Americans need. And uh, Dallas, we can go ahead and roll the video. But with, uh, with railroads, just about everything that we have is in, in our uh, lives are touched by rail. And when I was a young stock clerk working at Sears, it just happened where um, I was in the shipping and receiving area and we would always get the call from the rail yard. Our next uh, container of goods or our next uh, uh, truckload of goods is coming off the, tra off the train. And I was always wondering, what, what has a train got to do with getting a shipment of, of goods by truck? Well, that's the, the intermodal system of uh, what we have. And so, you know, the railroads employ a lot of people. As a matter of fact, uh, from the Canadian Pacific uh, Railroad, 15,000 employees uh, live, and, uh, live in uh, 1,100 North American communities. And they do this because, as they say, hunger is an issue that can and does impact all of our neighbors. Since 1999, the Canadian Pacific Railroad has, done, has managed to raise close to nine and a half million dollars of uh, donations and uh, of cash donations and 3.3 million pounds of food that gets donated to local food, uh, food shelves. And they partner in, their, in the communities, especially the communities like Hastings, as you're seeing right now, where they have um, already existing rail infrastructure. Uh, they say that any activities that occur at the outdoor event are organized in partnership with the municipality and the chosen food bank. And so this, the holiday train that they've been doing now for 16 years really impacts a lot of people. And I really have to commend the Canadian Pacific Railroad for putting this on every year for 16 years. I, I really think they've done a fabulous job. And it was really great to see all of the kids that turned out, uh, especially at Hastings when Santa Claus came out and they were all so giddy and excited. And it really brought back the magic of Christmas. And as much as we see the commercialization of the holiday season and stores are now putting their merchandise on the shelves and playing Christmas music that much earlier, just for one two hour stretch, it's just nice to see everybody get together and just enjoy seeing something like this. And that is a live railroad. And here it is coming into Union Depot last night. <laughs> 